California, undeniably beautiful and undeniably maddening at the same time. Sometimes it feels like everyone wants to live here, but nobody can afford to. So today we're doing a case study on a city that exemplifies all of it, a microcosm of how progressive ideals run up against NIMBY policies, a love affair with signs that have lots of words on them, and most importantly, why I can't pronounce the name of this city correctly. It's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer-suggested topics always welcome, and this wasn't really anyone's idea, except I got invited out to speak at a student conference at Cal Poly, which I'll touch on briefly later. And I'm just gonna address this right up front. The way locals pronounce the name of this city is San Luis Obispo, which as an outsider seems strange, but what I quickly realized is that the quote unquote correct way to pronounce basically any name of Spanish language origin in these parts is simply to pronounce it as if you had no idea the Spanish language existed at all. I'll actually come back to this, but for the most part, I'm gonna refer to this city the way I heard it most often, which is slow. It's California, so there's a lot of stuff you can and should ridicule. They can handle it. But let's just state for the record that this is an absolutely gorgeous part of our country. Slo is surrounded by these hills or moros that come right up on the city and are sort of ever present in the background as you go about your business. And just to orient you to the location, since it isn't a city with the very highest name recognition, it's in the central coast region of California, roughly halfway between the Bay area and greater LA. Population, around 50,000, and I'd say it has a downtown that punches way above its weight for a city of 50k. Charming, walkable streets with unbroken pedestrian-oriented building frontage. The vehicular traffic is reasonably well-behaved, and on Thursday nights, they shut down traffic altogether for a street market. It's good vibes. Several restaurants along the main drag advertise creekside dining, and yes, there is a creek that runs right through downtown on the inside of some of the busiest blocks with its own walking path. Not super active at the beginning of February, but I can use my imagination. Slow is pretty good for biking. There's protected bike infrastructure downtown and lots of low traffic streets that work pretty well for shared use. It's not uncommon for cities to put sharrows on streets like this. Well, Slow uses the largest sharrows known to mankind. Transit, it's a good system for a city of 50k. Remember, this is a college town. Decent frequencies, and I did ride it, which I'll come back to later. But I just want to point out that this is literally slow transit, and you better believe the agency knows that their tagline is being read phonetically. Remember, this city is geographically equidistant from SoCal and the Bay Area, and having a slow pace is apparently considered a feature, not a bug. Oh, and this is the slow train station. I don't really have anything to say about it. I just know that if I don't include it in the video, there's a certain type of person who watches my channel who will get extremely distraught and we just can't have that. Here's what I want to talk about though. This is a city that's fairly infamous for the number of reasonably normal human behaviors that are restricted or just outright banned. Like, I know this isn't literally the most restrictive place you can possibly live in the US, but it's gotta be like 99.9th percentile. And there's a reason why the city is sometimes dubbed Ban Luis Obispo. For example, this is somewhat famously the first city in the US to ban fast food drive through restaurants, which I have talked about in a couple other videos. That's really just the beginning though. You want to put balloons or floppy wavy guys outside your business? Do it in another city. Skateboarding downtown will get you a ticket. Interested in having a pet rabbit? Just keep it moving down the road. It's not happening here. You can't feed ducks. No gas-powered leaf blowers on Sundays, which is still honestly six fewer days a week than they should actually be outlawed. But really, one of my favorites is Municipal Code 12.32.110 on naming streets, which states that all street names should be pleasant sounding and easy to read, spell, and pronounce. Which is funny because this is literally a place where the city's own citizens can't even pronounce the name of their city correctly. The main street that runs right through downtown, the locals pronounce it Higuera. I'm not even kidding. And I'm sort of being harsh. I realize we all call Los Angeles Los Angeles, but the ordinance is funny. 
I think, ostensibly, it's to make it easier for small children or whatever to communicate location in case of emergency. But then, instead of doing the street signs in an ultra-readable street sign font like Clearview, they're done up like medieval theme park wayfinding. I just... I don't know. Like, they managed to use extremely standard, readable font on pretty much every other sign. It's just, the font is often very small because they really like to put a lot of words on signs, usually multiple signs. Extremely detailed parking restrictions, as if you were in Manhattan. Signs telling you where you can and can't go. Signs to let you know you're being watched. Signs reminding you that you can't smoke, which I kind of agree with a lot of this stuff, but it's just a lot. Especially when there are so many objectionable things they haven't banned. Like convenience stores right on the main drag through the center of town, not banned. High-end Scandinavian car dealerships, also right on the main drag. Skateboard shops are apparently totally legal, even though skateboarding itself isn't. This business, totally cool and legal. More things that are deemed completely acceptable. Quote-unquote bike routes that don't have any identifiable infrastructure or even markings of any kind. Green-painted buffered bike lanes that are right in the door zone. This style of bike rack, which unaccountably seems to be really popular here. Paving materials that get extremely slippery in the rain, and it did absolutely pour when I was here. These things, still totally legal and awesome. I mean, this city has a lot of things that I would personally outlaw if I had absolute power. Any of these kinds of places, this chain, fast fashion, any place that sells athleisure, or having literal lifestyle centers that take up multiple blocks of your downtown, now um, that is absolutely permissible. Honestly, you could argue that this is better than having them on the outskirts of downtown, except now you need downtown parking structures. Just to reiterate, having a rabbit as a pet is an affront to civilized society, but devoting chunks of prime downtown real estate to cheap vehicle storage, totally awesome. Okay, I'm being grouchy. Slow is really nice and pleasant, and a lot of what I've shown you is done better here than it is in the vast majority of cities this size in our country. But in a minute, I'm gonna get into a couple city ordinances that are actually just a little more disturbing. But first, a brief reminder to click on all the things. The bell is especially useful if you want to be notified of like breaking news or emergency live streams, whatever. Connect on all the usual websites if you want to see more pictures of my cats. And Patreon is super important when it comes to giving this channel anything that resembles financial stability. By the way, this was another speaking engagement, this time for the Student Leadership Summit of the Institute of Transportation Engineers Western District. Very cool to meet with the youngs who are really gonna be the next generation of people who are planning and designing our city's transportation systems. And it turns out an absolutely shocking number of them watch this channel and I don't quite know how to feel about that. Okay, so it got exhausting trying to find ways to be annoyed by slow, which by any measure is a beautiful, walkable, livable small US city. So I hopped Route 12, which runs once an hour and gets you to Morro Bay right on the Pacific in like 26 minutes. It's shocking that it takes so little time because you feel like you're departing from a mountain town and then less than half an hour later, you're standing at the edge of the Pacific Ocean. I don't know how much there really is to say. It's a pleasant seaside town, a lot like the places I used to go on the Oregon coast to get away for a weekend. Except warmer, I suppose. All the usual trappings, saltwater taffy, gift shops that sell knickknacks for married people who hate each other, overpriced seaside restaurants. These tacos were actually amazing though. There really is something about gazing out onto the Pacific that speaks to me, but eh, it's probably a me thing. Morro Bay does have its own idiosyncratic rules, though. Not being able to steal plants, that's like borderline fascism. Back to slow. I think someone in a recent live stream suggested that when I do a city visit, I should go back and look at the different metrics I use when I'm analyzing cities. So if you care, citywide walk and bike scores of 56 and 69 respectively. Although if I drop a pin on Iguera, sorry, Higuera, and Choro downtown, it's 99 and 91. Eh, I covered a lot of this in my College Towns video. Median rent, over $2,500. What are you gonna do? It's California. People want to live here. Another comment I got a lot on my last live stream was that I should do a video on 
California Forever, which if you don't know what it is, it's this idea of building a whole new city in Solano County outside the Bay Area from whole cloth as a way of relieving some of the state's housing crunch. It's backed by a bunch of tech billionaires and when you read about it, you keep having to remind yourself that you aren't reading about one of those misguided utopian high-tech cities they're always proposing on the Arabian Peninsula. I don't know if I'll do a video about it, but the galling thing is, California has literally hundreds of cities that already have the infrastructure to support thousands of additional housing units. It's just apparently too politically difficult to do things that should be much more technically straightforward. Like one thing you might have noticed in all the images of slow that I've shown you so far, there aren't any cranes in the air. If you squint, you can see a bit of multifamily, but median rent over $2,500. There's tons of demand to live here. I can't imagine construction doesn't pencil out. Well, let's look at a couple more city ordinances that may or may not be related. No overnight camping in vehicles. No smelling bad if you want to use a public library. And no sitting in one place for more than an hour. A cynical person might say these things, as well as the design of the benches, are simply intended to annoy the unhoused into moving to another city that has less persnickety laws. Again, it's a very nice city, and slow is literal. It's a city where having a slow pace of life is not only considered a virtue, but a selling point that differentiates the city. And this is a great tension in urban planning, part of the reason why so many people want to live in a city like this, and why prices are so high is because they've very intentionally made it a place where people want to live. There's a tension between being free to do whatever you want, which is kind of a Houston approach, and on the other hand, making things sufficiently restrictive so that you curate the type of urban environment you want. It's funny, conservatives or libertarians will tell you that they hate this kind of government overreach or whatever, and will go on and on about the nanny state, but then they'll literally choose to live in some suburban subdivision with crazy restrictive HOAs and covenants. Look, I'm all about people having choices when it comes to living in a variety of urban or suburban environments. Really, as I've been visiting so many cities in the last year, the idea I've really latched onto is that having that diversity of urban contexts across a variety of geographies should, in theory, allow for the most possible self-selection and self-sorting. And what I always come back to is the places that are the most walkable and bikeable that give you the greatest opportunity to avoid car dependency are almost always the places with the highest demand and are the most expensive. And as I travel and try to grasp what's going on in all these different cities, the staggeringly obvious thing I keep thinking is we need to build more of the type of places that have the highest demand and probably not as greenfield development, but let me think about it some more. Being able to travel more is something I've really enjoyed about the evolution of my channel, but it does make it a little more challenging for me to do my actual job, which is making videos for you all. When I'm traveling, I'm working and hooking up to Wi-Fi and coffee shops, hotels, airports, and that's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, comes in. A lot of what I do is just writing and editing that I don't need an internet connection for. But I do spend a lot of time in my Google account, including YouTube Studio, and I don't want to have to worry about what kind of information I'm putting out on the local Wi-Fi. This is all stuff I'd prefer not to worry about, but the reality is there are any number of things that bad intentioned people can do if they get a hold of your IP address. Like they can do a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack, which is not fun and is sometimes part of like a ransom scheme or some other nefarious plot. But if you're logged into NordVPN, which is just one click, that person isn't gonna get your actual IP address. You're gonna be anonymous. This is really just one piece of what makes NordVPN indispensable for me. It also has next-gen encryption. It blocks malware and trackers. It gives me peace of mind when I'm traveling and also when I'm back home working remotely at coffee shops and other beverage establishments, which is a thing I do pretty often. And this is why I recommend NordVPN so strongly. I like to work from anywhere and not have to worry about it. What can I say? I'm an urbanist. 
I love a good third place. Anyway, if you sign up for any of NordVPN's two-year plans during the current promotional period, you're gonna get four bonus months on top if you use my code. And your NordVPN subscription comes with access to their proxy browser extension, which is a more lightweight, flexible option for getting the benefits of a VPN. Like if you're borrowing someone's computer, you can log in and add the extension. Or if you have apps that you want to keep using your actual IP while your browser stays anonymous, it can come in handy. But I just keep NordVPN logged on wherever I go because it works for everything I do. Again, make sure you use the code down in the description. It's going to get you four months for free and it's going to help support this channel too. And thanks again. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining and thanks as always to the patrons whose direct support really gives me the freedom to branch out and do these events where I can connect with the people who are going to be influencing our build environment for years to come. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.